The distinguished panelists for the session are Ian Talbot, Professor of Modern British History, University of Southampton, United Kingdom. Aisha Jalal, Mary Richardson, Professor of History, Tufts University, United States. And chairing the session is Dr. Yanish Kudesia, Associate Professor of South Asian Studies, NUS. I will now hand the floor to Dr. Kudesia. Okay, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to, to come. I've, I've visited uh, Singapore before, National University, but not uh, a joint event like this, which is a, uh, a new development, as we've heard already today. And what I wanted to really do was to use this as an opportunity to go back and look at some of the um, Manhattan papers, which uh, Yanis should already mentioned there at Southampton, and to see um, what we can glean from those in terms of uh, British intentions regarding the partition uh, of India uh, in 1947. Uh, and as he's already hinted, uh, the whole role of that matter uh, is incredibly controversial uh, as far as this is concerned, uh, in terms of uh, whether it was his personal policy, whether he basically messed it up uh, because of his uh, desire to uh, leave India uh, as soon as he could uh, and not to take a measured approach uh, to partition. There's also all the controversies about whether he favoured uh, India over Pakistan in terms of the boundary awards, uh, whether his personal relationship with Nehru uh, certainly led to um, the squeezing out of Jinnah in this process, which has already been referred to, uh, or, or whether, as I'm going to try and argue, in many respects, uh, Mountbatten created this mythology that he had far more influence in terms of uh, the partition than was reality of reacting to events, both on the ground and in terms of 
a grand British strategy uh, relating to uh, what they wanted to try and achieve. And indeed, in some senses, partition could be seen as a reluctant move, not something that uh, certainly Van Patten uh, was even determined on when he arrived uh, in India, uh, but something that was reluctantly agreed upon by the British in order to try and serve wider strategic interest ultimately. Although initially, uh, partition was actually not a popular policy as far as uh, the India office was concerned uh, and, and British officials because of the fact that it might actually undermine uh, some of Britain's interests uh, in uh, maintaining particularly a military influence. We've already heard reference to the fact that uh, obviously the uh, Indian Army was a crucial element uh, in British imperial power. So the fear of what the division uh, of the Indian Army uh, might do in terms of British strategic interests uh, was one factor uh, in uh, influencing uh, opinion. So those people who uh, sort of try and read back uh, the idea that um, Pakistan was deliberately created uh, as a kind of military bastion uh, for uh, British interests, I think uh, if you look at the actual records at the time, uh, it's the opposite. And there's the fear uh, that uh, partition and the division of the army will undermine uh, British strategic interests. And what we've got to bear in mind is that Britain, uh, when it was handing over power uh, to uh, the Indian subcontinent, um, was still uh, an avowed imperial power. Uh, the independence of India was not seen, uh, though with hindsight it's often viewed as the beginning of the end of the British Empire, that wasn't necessarily the way it was viewed by contemporaries. So a means of trying to maintain uh, British influence as an imperial power uh, was a crucial factor, I think, in thinking about uh, future strategic developments. Uh, obviously, after Pakistan was created, uh, and certainly in the context of the emerging Cold War, and also in the context uh, of fears of uh, Pakistan's weakness and possible collapse uh, after the emergence of the Kashmir uh, dispute uh, leads to British strategic thinking and of course also the United States which becomes drawn into the region because of the Kashmir conflict and because of um, its Cold War perspective leads to the notion of Pakistan as a military bastion, and of course this is reflected in the 1954 um, military agreement, uh, which is signed between uh, Pakistan and the United States. But to read back from 1954 to 1947, and what the intentions are, uh, I think really is, is mistaken, though obviously uh, Narendra Singh Sarilla in the shadow of the great game, uh, and obviously you're in the Chadha's film, which is um, quite a controversial film, which came out of Weissler's hat uh, last year, you know, uh, very much look at uh, this notion of, of, of a kind of almost conspiracy to create uh, Pakistan as a military bastion. But that doesn't really uh, stand up to an analysis uh, of, of the record. Partition and British end of empire, uh, we've already heard in the, the lecture how uh, partition was certainly um, a factor in a number of British decolonizations. And yet, uh, again, I think if you look broadly uh, at uh, British decolonization, often it's federation, uh, which is the preferred option coming out of decolonization, not partition as such, and partition is more, uh, I, I think, related to particular circumstances, usually as we've again heard uh, already in terms of uh, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, uh, as a means to solve a problem, not necessarily a preferred option, which is for bigger units, and the reason for that is because bigger units will be stronger. Uh, and again, I think this is 
something which is influenced uh, within the Cold War uh, context. This links in with the strategic thinking in British uh, policy. Uh, and I think what Britain wants to do is to be in control uh, of uh, events, uh, or to at least give the perception of being in control of events, which may be spiraling out of control in reality. It certainly doesn't want to give the impression, as we'll see later on, uh, of uh, a retreat. Uh, it's got to be something which is seen, uh, decolonization, uh, and partition of the subcontinent is linked in with this as a success story. That's very difficult to sell, of course, with the uh, massacres and migrations which actually accompany uh, the partition. But the aim in all of this is to try and maintain British prestige. This is where Mountbatten's role comes in. Uh, as viceroy, to try and maintain British prestige and not to be signaling uh, to the United States or, or, to, or to the wider world that Britain is in retreat and decline. That's not the story, not the narrative uh, that needs to be told. Uh, and I think we're, we're hearing I should go up a paper that um, there's lots of different narratives that uh, people with interest are trying to tell about uh, independence of the Indian subcontinent, uh, about what it means for the creation of Pakistan, and indeed uh, different narratives in terms of who to blame for what went wrong. And that fact is obviously uh, often the person that is uh, earmarked as the person to blame. Uh, and also narratives about uh, is this a fulfillment? of uh, British rule, the whole transfer of power, the language that you use, we've already heard that in terms of partition, the language which is used in itself uh, is influential in terms of a story, a historical narrative that is trying to be told. So transfer of power itself uh, indicates a, a notion of uh, a natural evolution to it rather than something which is outside of, uh, perhaps, uh, British control. So, uh, strategic thinking in British policy, I think, are very important. Uh, and then, of course, while I'm making this statement, uh, I'm inevitably indicating that uh, when Britain hands over power, which eventually turns out to be independence along with partition, uh, it's Britain putting its interests first. It's Britain's interests first as a um, still an imperial power. It's Britain its interests first in terms of not wanting lots of British troops to be returning in body bags uh, as a result of them getting caught in the middle uh, of a communal conflict, as it's understood. It's, it's Britain's interests first in trying to preserve some of the elements uh, that it had traditionally had in terms of the strategic value uh, of the subcontinent uh, for this wider uh, British Empire, which of course is still extending uh, to the Far East, as it was called in those days after uh, Indian independence, still includes large areas of Africa, uh, and still, of course, requires uh, secure communication links between Britain and uh, New Zealand and Australia. So that those are the interests, uh, really, that uh, Britain uh, is trying to pursue. So the role of Mount Patton, uh, and uh, I've put on this heading here, myth and reality, and, th and there's so much myth surrounding Mount Patton's role uh, in all of this. Much of this myth, of course, is of his own making. Uh, and then he tries to give the impression that he's the person who was holding in the palm of his hand almost uh, the whole future of the subcontinent, that he is the man who is um, sort of in control uh, and achieving, uh, from his perspective, a successful uh, transfer of power. Uh, and of course that myth, which uh, was helped to be created uh, by um, both uh, Mountbatten 
some actions at the time, the way they were presented by Alan Campbell Johnson, his presence actually, the first spin doctor, you could say, uh, of uh, an end of empire situation. Uh, Van Patten, the fact that there's the archive, which is, uh, I've already mentioned, at Southampton University, which was purchased at a considerable cost from Broadlands, just down the road uh, from the University of Southampton, the, the fact that uh, Van Patten created this archive it was all part of this mythologizing uh, of his role and trying to present his uh, vision uh, uh, of uh, what he achieved uh, in, in partition. So there is this myth uh, that uh, Mountbatten created, and of course, this myth in itself leaves him open to criticism. Because if he is all powerful in the way that he presents himself, then you can attach a lot of the blame for the failings uh, that the company partition, you know, and this is a human tragedy at the greatest scale. I mean, we're talking about uh, 16 million people uprooted. We've already heard about the scars of partition, which still uh, impact our relations between India and Pakistan today. Uh, a million people, or perhaps more than a million people, died as a result of uh, the, the violence at the time, which you could argue uh, the British could have done more to prevent, uh, so that um, all of this um, tragedy of partition, if Mountbatten builds himself up as this great figure who was in control, uh, all of this can be attached to him, and it's his fault uh, for uh, these uh, human uh, tragedies which accompany partition. Certainly, uh, and I don't want to go in, it's not the main focus of my paper would be a digression of all of the ins and outs of where Mountbatten failed, where he might have done things differently. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, by creating this uh, image of himself as a person in control, uh, he's also opening himself up uh, for criticism. And this is why, of course, the vice royalty is still today of Mountbatten so immensely controversial. Um, what do we mean by this? Uh, is this just again a, a sort of um, a British narrative which has been created to try and deflect blame for the failings uh, and the tragedies uh, which accompany uh, partition? Obviously, there's that element, uh, in it, but I think that we need to go beyond this uh, for two very important reasons. Firstly, um, as far as partition was concerned from the British perspective, as I've said already in strategic terms, it could be a disaster. Uh, so for that reason, uh, there is a reluctance. And the reluctance isn't um, sort of just about Pakistan's potential military weakness and the division uh, of the uh, Indian Army and how that undermines the Indian Army's ability to underpin uh, British power in the world. But there, there are also, if you read uh, in the India office particularly, there's lots of reports about um, Pakistan's possible uh, inability uh, to survive economically. Uh, and that is also feeds into, of course, how, if that's the case, could it maintain the role of that part of the subcontinent in terms of protecting the whole of the subcontinent from, obviously, potential uh, invasion from the Soviet Union, for example, or China. So there is this reluctance. It's not just about undermining the prestige of Britain's um, self-role in unifying, but also um, the strategic concerns. So I think that Reluctant partition is, is certainly uh, not just a creation uh, of a narrative uh, in terms of trying to um, present the best possible case. And certainly what is very interesting is if you go really dig deep into the map of the papers, you'll see that uh, even at the sixth staff meeting on the 31st of March, 1947, 
there was still a discussion going on about a constitutional solution uh, which would involve going back to the cabinet mission proposals of the previous summer, uh, which would have given uh, obviously a lot of devolved power uh, within the subcontinent, but within the frame uh, of uh, an all India union. Certainly, Mary Clinton, there's no evidence in the records that he went to India with a predetermined partition plan in his head. Uh, that doesn't seem to, uh, to be there in the records. Um, that leads on, of course, to the next point. Uh, it's not just the British, perhaps, who are reluctantly accepting partition. Uh, but also uh, the Indian National Congress reluctantly accepted the partition. The Indian National Congress, as we all know, had, had always stood for a, a unified view uh, of uh, India. Uh, it did not uh, sort of put forward any proposals at all uh, for partition. Uh, and indeed, Nehru, in many senses, articulated the view uh, that uh, Indian unity um, was the most important thing going forward. So why is it that the Congress uh, accepts partition? Uh, and what is the importance of this for Britain? Uh, I'll, I'll tackle the second question first. What is important for Britain is Britain does not want to appear, or even not just appear, but actually enforce partition on the Indian parties. If it does have to do this, or it appears to have done this, this could be very damaging to British long-term interest in the subcontinent. And, and that goes back to my original point about the strategic vote and about the fact that the Britain, in a sense, um, although the reality doesn't ever work out this way, is searching for some kind of means of still having power and influence in the Indian subcontinent, despite independence. And indeed, in an odd sort of way, independence is a way of delivering future influence uh, for, for Britain, without having the responsibility in a diminished uh, power uh, resource to actually have to rule, but to maintain <laughs> So it's important for Britain that the Congress agrees and it can't be something that's imposed uh, on uh, Congress. That means to open the question, why does Congress agree to partition? I'm not going to go into all of this, because Aisha, I'm sure her paper is going to be mentioning uh, partly some of the reasons why Congress accepts it. And it does boil down to a number of factors, one of which, of course, is that Nehru does want a strong centre in order to uh, develop and modernize uh, uh, India, and, and he feels that this may be more easily achieved by shearing off, perhaps, uh, certain uh, areas. But uh, Nero is also, of course, not wanting a balkanization of the subcontinent uh, or a big Pakistan. This is where the squeezing <laughs> argument uh, comes in. A mocking Pakistan is often the terminology which is given, which means that um, Punjab and Bengal, two major Muslim majority provinces, uh, but with areas with significant uh, non Muslim majorities also, uh, these are to be divided. So, partition is not just the partition of the subcontinent, but partition is also the division uh, of uh, Punjab uh, and uh, Bengal. And of course, this suits the Congress. Position. Uh, it doesn't necessarily want the big Pakistan. Uh, and also, of course, uh, from the Congress perspective, and no one, of course, we've got to say here, anticipates the economic and human costs that the partition uh, of Punjab and Bengal uh, is going to bring in its way. Uh, but uh, Congress may see that a Mothi in Pakistan with a strong sense of India uh, it is uh, the best way forward for getting a relatively speedy British decolonization. And the British, of course, also 
begin to see a partition because uh, Macbeth holds numerous interviews in the first month in which he is uh, in situ uh, as uh, viceroy. And it's only only after all of these interviews across in the political parties, uh, with journalists uh, and, and other people that he really comes down to the idea that uh, partition is the option uh, for delivering uh, British uh, departure. From the subcontinent. And there's a, a convergence uh, in this period of time of, of uh, British interests in the kind of partition, not just partition, but what kind of partition are we going to have? There's a convergence uh, in the um, Congress and the British uh, view of what kind of partition may deliver the things that both parties want after independence. Uh, uh, and that's why um, the British don't have to impose the uh, in partition It's something which is accepted uh, by the Congress. Obviously, the Muslim League's in a weak position. Uh, actually, Gerard's work has shown how Jinnah is uh, in, really boxed into a corner. The Muslim League's in a weak position and comes down to it has to accept anything, even if it's a mock in Pakistan by this juncture. The stage managing uh, of independence and partition. Uh, again, Mount Platten is a crucial role here uh, because this is going to be a successful uh, Wavell had already been really quite unceremoniously sacked as Viceroy because he uh, was seen by uh, the Labour government in London as defeated, as he was seen as someone with his breakdown plan that was going to present a view of the British departure from India as an imperial retreat rather than as this transfer of power and natural evolution uh, of British policy. This was the story uh, that uh, the cabinet had decided that it wanted to have told. Uh, so Mount Batten, in a way, um, it is uh, seen as a figure who can help deliver this. Uh, and of course, you have this. Um, track record that he already uh, in uh, Southeast Asia command with Alan Campbell Johnson, his future press attaché alongside, developed uh, the use of the press. He's already very much into public relations. Uh, he's very much, uh, because of his own ego, wanting to put himself forward uh, in a positive light. He's good at manipulating the media and film. It's very modern uh, in this sense. Uh, and the whole aim, really, of the stage managing of independence and partition is, is of course, for the British to try and present this uh, as, as a success. Uh, and um, so Mount Batten gets it filmed. Uh, he gets it clearly agreed with Nehru that there should be no um, obvious sign of the lowering of the Union Jack in any of these film strips, uh, because this will look like Britain defeat, uh, so that uh, it, it's a, it's a stage-managed uh, process, which Mac Batten is probably the best person to fulfill. However, of course, the partition violence begins almost immediately afterwards, and this uh, is much more difficult, because you're then getting stories coming out which are of a negative rather than a positive. Nature. The Commonwealth moment, uh, basically, um, one of Mountbatten's key aims uh, was that um, India and Pakistan would join the Commonwealth. He sees this from as early as April 1947 as one of his key priorities. Uh, why is this? Again, it's because of the uh, evolution of the Commonwealth uh, and, 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 and a success story. These two uh, new Asian powers uh, taking their place in the Commonwealth uh, alongside the old established white dominions within the Commonwealth. Uh, so that's one uh, sort of positive story that, that uh, the British wanted to tell. But also, Commonwealth membership, and this links back to the strategic issue, Commonwealth membership would mean. Uh, that uh, there wouldn't have to be a military treaty signed 
to secure British interest in the Far East uh, if these two countries are within the Commonwealth. Uh, they can still be uh, in involved, so the British hoped, uh, in uh, their strategic uh, concerns. So the Commonwealth moment uh, is a great hope, uh, and the Commonwealth is to serve Britain's interests as a continuing great power. That's important to bear in mind. I wouldn't go quite so far as to say substitute empire, but it's sort of, uh, that's the way some people are thinking about it uh, in, in the world. Uh, but of course it doesn't happen, okay, they, it doesn't happen in that way, in part because of the emergence of the Kashmir dispute, which throws everything out as far as Britain's hopes for uh, the Commonwealth concerned. Uh, there's the embarrassment of two Commonwealth members being at war with each other. The whole evolution of the Commonwealth is disrupted uh, by this. And also the hopes that somehow or other that there could be a strategic military interest still served by the subcontinent after independence. Uh, it's all thrown out by the Kashmir issue, which of course is often seen as part of the unfinished business uh, of partition. So just to sort of round up the last minute or two. Linkages and comparative dimensions. Um, in many senses, of course, I'm arguing this, this is a unique set of circumstances. Uh, it's something which is agreed upon very late in the day, the partition. It's something which is, certainly doesn't have the years of discussion and planning that Palestine does. And we've already heard that uh, it's very different anyway because it's uh, the difference between a mandated territory and bringing other uh, powers into play in the British decolonization. There are similar contexts. One of them, of course, is that in both instances, partition is still seen as part of the decolonization process, uh, which is not to show British defeat. Uh, and is part of a British process of still trying to maintain itself. Because we've got to remember that right the way down to the Suez crisis, Britain still has pretensions of being a great power. Uh, after the Second World War. And also the other similarity is this context of ethnic conflict, communal conflict, uh, the debate about whether or not British troops should be committed in that context, uh, and uh, how um, perhaps uh, partition could be a way of speeding up uh, what is seen as an uh, end of empire or end of mandate uh, situation, which is threatening uh, its prestige uh, and, and strategic influences. Uh, so there are similarities as well as obviously uh, considerable uh, differences between uh, these two partitions. But I think that, uh, as we'll see, hopefully in some of the later papers, uh, uh, there is more scope, I think, for comparative study than has happened before. And certainly um, from the, the subcontinental perspective, there hasn't been really been that sustained uh, interest in uh, these two partitions. Thank you.
vaccine references to Alan Campbell points in his French profession, but also. So, in some ways, he, he began by adopting the narrative very early on, and I think one of the first uh, manifestations of that was Alan Campbell points in so in some ways I'm asking about how can one get to the entire way this archive that you want to mention. The second is I think you are very persuasive about what you say about the complex state between him and emergence by the question by how he the relative partition. I think that is the point of which can be accepted given the British feeling about him. In the in the forties but you know, the, and one can see the ground resistance between him and the Congress to some extent about the principle of power. Uh, and then Congress were not alone, they were the Indian business, they were the Bengali Hindus, there were various constituencies who were interested in an early scenario and partition of the original institution. But my questions really are about the format of partition, particularly in terms of the third group plan and the the way the party union was set up, its term of reference, uh, its point. So I, I think these are the questions which you persist a lot around that in uh, So could you please tell us something about the third issue uh, and the prominent commission? For example, why for the party commission? Uh, it could have produced a verdict which may have been subject to arbitration. Why was it? Which had to be arbitrary, final, and absolute. Mm -hmm. So, this is one question. Uh, of course, then why were the lawyers put in place? And they all represented, uh, you know, one part, one side of the living house, and the other side of the Congress. So, it had to produce that kind of argument to provide it for so These are the kind of questions which you have made. Uh, my final comment is really about the, what you say about. Well, the expectation that Commonwealth will be a kind of a defense organization that the new uh, That did not really happen. World Cup. That did not really happen. And the 1954 arrangements came much later. But in between, there was a lot of, there was this interregnum which did not produce the kind of expectations which the British had from the security regime in this country. So, it comes Okay, yes. Um, I mean, what is interesting about the composition of the Barrow Commission is that Oscar Spate was one of the few geographers who was actually involved in this. Most of the people uh, who were making the presentations uh, from the various parties or, or sitting in judgment on this uh, were lawyers. Going back to the point about the role of lawyers uh, in partition, um, the issue of um, Mountbatten's role in this, and whether or not, of course, he influenced the Barrington Commission, is that one of the numerous controversies surrounding the, uh, the Mountbatten Viceroyalty. Um, certainly, uh, from within Pakistan, that you would very much be that uh, this is one of the key examples. Uh, of Mountbatten's pro-India bias uh, at the end of empire. Uh, the talk of possibly the Daspur district, which had a bare Muslim majority, uh, being awarded uh, to India, uh, and, and that's a feature in some of the communal violence. I think um, if you look at the work of Lucy Chester on uh, the Boundary Commission, uh, she's written quite extensively on this. Uh, one of the things which comes out is that the the Boundary Commission is part of the whole um, smoke and mirrors job uh, which the British uh, are engaged in to try and give an impression that they are in control of the situation uh, relating to transfer of power uh, and that uh, this is a, a means uh, of, of, of doing that and I think that um, certainly the Boundary Commission and the way in which it operated raised tensions uh, before the British actual transfer of power uh, and is a factor in why uh, 
the third view plan, the partition plan, didn't resolve the crisis. Because the whole idea of partition was sold on the basis that uh, partition would be a means to ending this uh, violence and political conflict which had racked the subcontinent uh, for a year or more. And, and of course it doesn't. Uh, it just opens the way to the terrible human tragedy that we've been referring to. Uh, and I think that part of it is, is because of the fact that there wasn't um, any sense uh, at the time of the Banker Commission or when the committees were sitting dividing assets uh, that um, there, there was any trust between the Muslim League and Congress in this. There wasn't any sense, I think, at all that the British, and certainly Mountbatten from the Muslim League perspective, was seen very much a pro-Indian figure. Uh, so there wasn't uh, a means through this partition machinery. Uh, and there's not much, much being written about the actual partition machinery. You know, the points about where can we, if we're going back to the high politics, what can we look at? The, the partition machinery itself is flawed, uh, and as a result of that, it doesn't resolve conflicts, but just creates new arenas uh, for conflict uh, between the parties. And I think that's quite important. Um, and of course, there's the whole issue of whether it's door to rush, but I haven't got time to go into that, but whether it had been a longer uh, and slower process working its way through, whether there would be less violence. Um, so I, I think that's where the Boundary Commission comes in, but the, the composition of the Boundary Commission uh, is failing to be very important. Um, in terms of the archive, yes, I mean, as with any archive, often it's the silences in the archive which are more telling than the actual documents which are there. Uh, there may be more papers going to be released, um, but that needs cabinet office approval. Uh, from the Mountbatten Archive, which is actually held at the University of Southampton in the next 18 months or so. Uh, and, and certainly, yes, I mean, Mission with Mountbatten, Alan Campbell Johnson's memoir, uh, really was establishing. Uh, the, the Mountbatten myth in terms of his role from the very early stage uh, in the uh, narrativization uh, of the transfer of power. Uh, and that's all part, I think, of this trying to um, sort of establish a, a particular narrative from the British perspective. And of course, um, the British have trying to create the narrative, and the post-independent Indian and Pakistan states have created their own narratives. Uh, so that's important also to bear in mind that this is just the British thing that we're talking about. All these, these, these parties are there, in a sense, and trying to present a view of partition uh, that, that serves either an imperial or a national interest. Pakistan, the struggle for Pakistan, 
online and global politics, published by Harvard University Press in 2014. May I request Mr. Jinnah? Thank you very much for the introduction, and I want to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak on a subject uh, which I've thought about a great deal, uh, but you don't typically uh, have an interest in partition. Uh, and, you know, apropos what Victor has set us up on what is partition, I think it depends a great deal uh, who is giving the answer, a lawyer, a historian, uh, or just an ordinary person. Uh, so what I do want to say, um, uh, just to preface my uh, presentation, which is drawn from a paper that I was asked to give, um, and just in the interest of, of time and uh, question and answers, I will draw from that rather than speak, uh, because the subject I can speak for hours uh, on it. What I do want to say is that what's curious about partition, of course, is that you know, we talk about um, uh, the British, uh, uh, the, the, the fact that it's an act of state, and I agree with you, uh, but it's ultimately political. It's a product of political processes. Um, and I think here, uh, what we tend not to recognize is that uh, it depends on our ideas of not just spatiality, but also our ideas of identity and how we constitute, and this is something that uh, your paper brings up. Uh, and finally, I do think that what is recognized in the world, especially of the IR-dominated world, as a mode of conflict resolution, a conflict management, um, arguably has become, uh, as Ian was referring to towards the end, uh, a, a means of uh, not having conflict resolution. And I think that is what we need to discuss. Why is it that what was always perceived as a mode of conflict uh, management is in fact become a mode of the impossibility of resolution? And I think the reason uh, and where I want to begin uh, is precisely the human dimension uh, that you were mentioning that high politics and, the, and I think it's important to link those two rather than to see one as better than the other. Uh, and so there, um, I would like to. Uh, I can get this one. Uh, where do I put it? Uh, may have become a distant memory for many, and 
as implications in public discourse limited simply to scoring points uh, on the grid of national patriotism. But its absent presences in everyday life across the Great Divide of 1947 are indicators of its historical significance, not merely as an event that took place seven decades ago, but a process that is very much part of our present. An ongoing process uh, with neither end nor beginning, partition structures the post-colonial South Asian experience. It is the foundational myth of both nation states. An institutionalized form of dividing and uh, disconnecting, partition uh, remains uh, uh, the popular myth of both states and it ferrets out people, communities, and linguistic uh, cultures. Uh, that were once historically, uh, that were once historically indivisible. If there are multiple slippages, illusions, and confiscations and narratives about the Great Divide that occurred uh, in 1947, there are also, as has been mentioned, strange silences about its constant reenactments uh, in the post-colonial uh, nation states of South Asia. Uh, an issue that I would be very happy to elaborate upon uh, in the question and answer. Uh, the nation, uh, with a capital N, uh, it's worth reminding ourselves, Tagore, Rabin Ranath Tagore had won in his little book, Nationalism, published uh, uh, exactly 100 uh, years ago, uh, or a little bit more than 100 years ago, with all its patriotic bragging, cannot hide the fact that the nation is the greatest evil for the nation. As the sun up of Western nations dance to the cash, of steel in the killing fields of Europe and the Middle East, the Bengali poet warned his fellow countrymen against the hubris of jingoistic pride that was embodied in the model of the nation state. Ramana Iqbal, uh, the Punjabi poet uh, philosopher, uh, who wrote in Urdu uh, uh, in the early 20th century and is generally considered to be uh, the visionary of Pakistan, had shared many of Tagore's concerns. Uh, about the dangers of worshipping the god of nationalism. On the roots of conflict, however, Iqbal had a final insight. In his considered view, it was nationalism that gave rise to the relativity of religions. The notion that religions were territorially specific and unsuited to the temperament of other nations. It was nationalism, therefore, and not religion, which by compartmentalizing people into different nations was the source of what this point of view uh, clashes with common uh, perceptions of religions all pervasive role in uh, South Asia. So it's not just coming to terms with partition, uh, but what exactly led to partition? Well, some people say it was uh, religion, religious passion, madness, communal madness. Others suggest that it may have to do uh, with uh, federalism, uh, a term that is not utilized very often when talking about partition causes. Uh, or others might even still say uh, that it had something to do with, uh, with conceptions of uh, our, uh, our conceptions of space, conceptions of space, state conceptions of space. Um, so we need to ask ourselves really whether categories of religion, uh, especially on which so many scholars have written uh, with great insight, uh, uh, should continue to be used in such blanket terms uh, to describe the four lines of freedom, certainly in South Asia. Uh, and I think this is something that uh, is, is, is extremely important if we are going to progress towards a more uh, coherent, more meaningful discussion of partition, uh, as, as, at least in the subcontinental stage. Uh, the binary opposition between secular nationalism and religious communalism, which is constantly invoked, is completely hopeless and inadequate for such an enterprise. Uh, it seems far more prudent uh, to take stock of the subcontinent's past and present without making fussy distinctions between the religious and the secular, the emotional and the rational, or the nationalist and the communalist. Uh, for purposes of conceptual clarity, uh, I think it's useful to remind ourselves of the subtle but important difference between religion as faith, a matter of personal faith, and religion as a social demarcator of identity. While religion as faith can be seen as a matter of personal belief, uh, religion as social demarcator uh, aims 
specifically at establishing boundaries with other communities. It is a distancing with others, not something uh, that is going to be attributed to personal belief necessarily. Uh, Tagore's critique of the aggressive nationalisms of modern nation states, along with his promotion of universalism, was not devoid of a religious sensibility. Iqbal envisaged Islam as a universal religion, which was neither national and racial, nor individual and private, but purely human. Religion as social demarcator, as both men knew from personal experience, was a mere label, not an accurate reflection of the religiosity of the individual believer, far less of the community uh, or the nation. Both men, in their different ways, affirm the inextricable overlap between temporal and spiritual life. All human life is spiritual, uh, Iqbal had argued. Uh, there was no such thing as a profane world. Uh, in their different ways, uh, Tagore and Iqbal have been pointed the dangers of letting religion as social demarcator appropriate the meaning, scope, and spirit of religion. Instead of translating Tagore's and Iqbal's ideas into practice, uh, it proved easier for uh, the managers of the post-colonial nation states of South Asia to appropriate them for their respective national agendas. If the differences between Mohandas Karim Chandani and Muhammad Ali Jinnah give a quintessential glimpse into the contrasts between the acknowledged fathers of independent India and Pakistan, the similarities between Tagore and Iqbal capture the as yet unrealized but potentially dynamic ability of these two congenital rivals to strike at some common cause. The potential, unfortunately, was not realized in the bitter end game of the British Raj. Uh, as Manto observed then, uh, previously religion used to reside in the heart. Now it resided in caps, whether the Gantt or the Jinnah cap, long live caps. A partition of India along self professedly religious lines has, of course, lent a teleological tendency uh, to the processes of historical retreat, uh, which has not been easy to shrug. It was mainly religion as social demarcator rather than concerns with religion as faith. Uh, not the dream of an Islamic theocracy, which informed the All India Muslim League's demand for a Pakistan in March 1940. For all those who constantly talk about partition as caused by religion, I'd like them to give me one instance of a major debate between the politicians of um, the Muslim League and the Congress on religion, uh, on theology. This was not a theological debate, this was a political debate. Why are we so uh, averse to calling what is political uh, and, and calling it religious? And I think this is something which is the main problem of not being able to come to terms with much. Um, well, the insistence, um, you see, it was a forward acclaim to nation. Indian Muslims were decidedly revolting against minoritarianism, caricatured as religious communalism. While the insistence on national status for Indian Muslims was absolute, uh, the demand for a separate and sovereign state and its relationship with Hindustan, containing almost as many Muslims, remained open to negotiations until the late summer of 1946. And I'd like to uh, just sort of take you through this Gavrikush plan, uh, which uh, provided uh, a, uh, a, a, a solution for a three tiered solution. Uh, for an All India Federation, uh, grouping of provinces A consisting of the Hindu majority provinces, uh, grouping of provinces B consisting of the Muslim majority provinces of the Northwest, uh, and then grouping of provinces C uh, consisting of Bengal and Assam in the Northeast, and of course the third tier being uh, the provinces. Um, so the, the point I'm trying to make here, and we all know that Jina accepted this um, uh, before um, Nehru came out. Um, on uh, uh, the, the of July 11th, 46, since 1946, and said that they were not prepared to accept uh, either grouping or a centre restricted to uh, three subjects. Uh, and who were the British to tell uh, the Indian Constitutional Assembly how to frame their constitution? Before that, um, what I want to say is the claim that Muslims constituted a nation was not incompatible, as Jinnah's acceptance of this uh, suggests, with a federal or confederal structure covering the whole of India. Uh, but for the federal idea to be accepted, the logic of majoritarianism and minoritarianism had to be abandoned and the fact of contested sovereignty acknowledged. This was about our sharing. I've been here uh, since 9 o'clock in the morning and haven't heard the words, so let me introduce the most important word, power sharing. It is the failure of power sharing that leads to partitions. 
In keeping with the better part of India's history, the overture of shared sovereignty, enunciated by Jenner and the Muslim League, seemed the best way of tackling the dilemma posed by the absence of any neat equation between Muslim identity and territory. With nations straddling states, the boundaries between them had to be permeable and flexible, not impenetrable and absolute. This is why Jinnah and the League remained implacably opposed to the partition of Punjab and Bengal uh, along religious lines, even while furthering the cause of a political division of India between Pakistan and Hindustan. Uh, Ian referred to this uh, earlier. Uh, I will go so far as to say that the partition of India is effectively the partition of Punjab and Bengal. In the event, it was ironically enough, the Congress, backed by the extreme right-wing Hindu Mahasabha, which plumbed for a partition of the two main Muslim majority provinces of India, conceding a Pakistan, which both in its shape and form had been rejected out of hand uh, by its proclaimed architect on two separate occasions, uh, first in 1944 and then again in 1946. So what did religion then have to do, uh, uh, as faith, have to do with the politics of difference um, in late colonial India? Very little, it would seem, insofar as the main stumbling block to evolving a framework for a united India were power sharing arrangements between members of different religious communities um, at the All India level, as well as uh, the key regions of Punjab and Bengal. Uh, prior to the British conquest, really worth reminding people, uh, relations between regional peoples and the sovereign power had never been defined only by religion. Despite a long history of creatively accommodating multiple levels of uh, sovereignty, the renegotiations of the terms for sharing power in an independent India saw the privileging of a rigid and monolithic conception of territorial sovereignty, a special kind of speciality, based on a singular and homogenizing idea of the nation, the singularity of the nation. An insistence on the unity of the nation and the corresponding refusal to countenance internal differences eventually paved the way for a partition of the subcontinent along religious lines. In 1971, yet another partition occurred uh, when Pakistan's eastern wing, containing a majority of its Muslim population, broke away to form Bangladesh. Uh, compounding the difficulties uh, of explaining these historical developments primarily in terms of religion, uh, uh, which I think uh, which obfuscates uh, the more significant uh, and enduring aspects of federalism. In one of uh, the more unforgettable contemporary recollections of Muhammad Ali Jinnah, Beverly Nichols in uh, Verdict on India described the lanky and stylishly dressed barrister um, as the most important man in Asia, looking every bit like a gentleman of Spain, of the old diplomatic school, the monocle wearing leader of the All India Muslim League had a pivotal place uh, in India's future. If Gandhi goes, there is Nehru, Rajagopalacharya, Patel, and a dozen others. But if Jinnah goes, who is there? Without the Kaile Azam to steer the course, uh, the Muslim League was a divisive and potentially explosive force uh, that uh, Nichols noted might run completely off the rails and charge through India with fire and slaughter. It might even start another war. As long as Jinnah was around, nothing disastrous was likely to happen, and so Nichols quipped a great deal hands on the grey silk cord of that monocle. He was right. Jinnah was a crucial link between the Congress and the Muslim League, which if broken could catapult India into disaster. While regaling journalists at a tea party in his honor uh, at Allahabad in April of 1942, uh, two years um, before, uh, sorry, two years after the formal orchestration of the demand for Pakistan by the All India Muslim League, Jinnah had emphatically denied harboring the slightest ill will against Hindus or any other community. Drawing an analogy between himself and the first man uh, to appear on the street with an umbrella, uh, only to be laughed and scorned at by the crowd that had never seen an umbrella before, uh, he said self assuredly, You may laugh at me, but the time will soon come when you will not only understand what the umbrella is, but use it to the advantage of every one of you. Jinnah's hope, of course, remains unrealized, making it all the more difficult to restore his proper place in history, far less the proper place of partition. Um, a skillful lawyer who won the respect of his peers at the bar, 
he imagined himself as someone who could bridge the communitarian differences, uh, which, uh, in this opinion, were the biggest obstacle uh, to India winning freedom. Fate deemed otherwise. Uh, Jinnah had hoped to negotiate a constitutional arrangement based on power sharing uh, between the Congress and the Muslim League, uh, representing Hindus and Muslims respectively. Uh, but then, of course, we know that even great men uh, make history under extreme constraints. Uh, many find it remarkable, uh, and to go on about this endlessly certainly in his home country, Pakistan, that Jinnah made history despite overwhelming odds. I would humbly humble add uh, that while this explains the attention given to his role in the creation of Pakistan, what is ignored in all of this is that if there has been a, a bit too much focus on the history Jinnah made, uh, there is still much to be said about the history that made Jinnah. Throughout his long and checkered career, uh, Jinnah remained remarkably consistent about his main political objectives. He had begun his journey as a congressman, um, seeking a share of power for Indians at the All India Center. Since Muslims were a minority, uh, in the limited system of representation in colonial India, he became an ardent champion of minority rights as a necessary step towards Hindu-Muslim uh, 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 union uh, and Congress and Congress League cooperation. The provincial bias in British constitutional reforms after 1919 tested the resilience of a centralist politician with all India ambitions. As a constitutionalist of rare skill and vision, Jinnah tried reconciling communitarian and provincial interests while always holding out an olive branch to Congress. While his insistence on national status for Indian Muslims remained absolute after 1940, the demand for a separate and sovereign state, as I've already suggested, remained open to negotiation until the late summer of 1946. He was acutely aware that almost as many members of the Muslim nation would reside in what he always referred to as Hindustan and not India, in this, uh, and, and, and I mean, they, they would be outside um, uh, the Muslim homeland. Zafrullah Khan, that um, uh, Victor has mentioned, had noted uh, in February 1940 in his memo uh, that a partition resulting in an exchange of population was utterly impractical. Uh, and would result in nothing but misery and suffering. Uh, the claim to nationhood was not an inevitable overture uh, to, uh, to, to, <coughs> to separate state, an analytical distinction between a division of sovereignty within India and a partition of the provinces enables a precise understanding of the demand for a Pakistan. On achieving Pakistan, Ajana was categorical that equal citizenship and an assurance of minority rights would form the basis of a new state. Um, now there's been a growing recognition amongst uh, sections of the scholarly community in India and Pakistan and abroad uh, that partition was the price that had to be paid um, for the Congress to inherit British India's unity center and integrate the princely states. Uh, history has a way of laying bare what is hidden or suppressed by individual and collective memory, an intrinsic unity in division that no amount of mechanical cartography can face. Seventy years after partition and independence, uh, uh, the Navy, uh, I mean, uh, and the establishment of Pakistan's Eastern Bengal and Bangladesh 30 years ago, the long history that binds the subcontinent's diverse peoples and um, uh, cultures uh, has not really receded completely into oblivion. It is, if anything, more present than ever, a veritable summons for those with daring to penetrate the veils that have been used to deny interconnections, whether in the name of region, religion, or nation. Ram Mohan Lohia, Ram Manohar Lohia, recalled a private conversation in Noakhali with Nehru at the instance of Mohandas Gandhi um, in November of 1946. And I quote, Mr. Nehru spoke of the water, slime, bush, and tree, Lohia wrote, that he found everywhere in East Bengal. He said that this was not the India he or I knew and wanted uh, with some vehemence to cut East Bengal away from the mainland of India. Lohia found this to be an extraordinary observation. He noted, these reasons of geography might, under some circumstances, Lohia commented, prove how necessary it is for the Ganga and the Jamuna plains to stay united with their luxuriant terminus. 
But once the idea of partition came to be accepted as a condition precedent to India's freedom, no matter what, uh, whether the acceptance was still very private and not even communi communicated to Gandhi, the geography of East Bengal could well become abominable. Much the same, I mean, this is, uh, I mean, I think for those who don't know, uh, the Gangetic, uh, uh, the, this alluvium is the, is, the, is the longest unbroken alluvium in the world. Um, so I think this is something worth pointing out. Uh, this, this, so much the same kind of thinking as Loya appears to have guided uh, the view of a major science uh, conference held in Delhi in the early 1950s. That the separation of Burma, uh, they are not today, India and Pakistan was, quote, a geological, geographical, and economic crime that flew in the face of nature and was unlikely to last for more than a century or two. The theories of nature have yet, so, so far, failed to shape the resolve of the post-colonial states to uphold their hostile postures and reject uh, calls for cooperation across arbitrarily, uh, and continue to reject calls for cooperation across arbitrarily drawn frontiers. Um, it remains to be see, seen, however, whether human nature or mother nature will have the final mark. And finally, um, Opposed to the partition of Punjab and Bengal until mid-1947, Jinnah was checkmated at the end game um, of the Raj by the votaries of uh, unitary and monolithic sovereignty. The precedent for such partitions uh, had been set uh, with the partition of the province of Ulster in the aftermath of World War I. In that sense, the partition of India was not paradigmatic, but may have tilted the balance uh, against a binational state and towards partition in Palestine. Jinnah's constitutional insights into the imperatives of forging new Indian Union, once the British quit, um, resonated well with a long-established tradition of South Asia uh, based on layered and shared sovereignties. Uh, the four decades since uh, the end of World War II were a heyday of indivisible sovereignty across the globe. Since the late 1980s, however, there has been a perceptible weakening uh, in the hold of that dogma. Uh, Jinnah's legacy, uh, I believe, uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons I'm here, is especially pertinent uh, to the enterprise of rethinking not just the validity of partitions, but most importantly of sovereignty in South Asia and beyond in the 21st century. If India and Pakistan can shed the dead weight of the colonial inheritance uh, of non-negotiable sovereignty and hard borders, uh, which has been at the root of uh, their animosities, a South Asian Union of sorts may yet come about under the capacious cover of Jinnah's metaphorical umbrella. His hope that Hindus quite as much as Muslims would one day bless the memory of his name has also not been fulfilled. Uh, but uh, moves in that direction have been in evidence more recently. The Indian Prime Minister, Rajpai, Adalbari Rajpai, made a point of visiting the venue where the Lahore Resolution of 1940 was adopted by the Muslim League. This was followed by the Hindu nationalist leader, Lal Krishna Advani's homage to the founding father of Pakistan at his Mussolini uh, in Karachi. Um, and it's also worth remembering that more than seven decades after partition, um, more than second decade after, after partition, that the Bimali leader, as, as Sarat Chandra Bose, uh, in his obituary comment on Jinnah's death, paid tribute to the memory of one who was great as a lawyer, once great as a congressman, great as a leader of Muslims, great as a world politician and diplomat, and greatest of all, a man of action. It is just sad that uh, the attempted conflict resolution has made his ideas, has immersed his ideas, making conflict resolution impossible. Thank you very much.